The Falklands War Spanish, Guerra de las Malvinas, also known as the Falklands Conflict, Falklands Crisis, Malvinas War, South Atlantic Conflict, and the Guerra del Atlántico Sur Spanish for South Atlantic War, was a ten-week war between Argentina and the United Kingdom over two British dependent territories in the South Atlantic, the Falkland Islands, and its territorial dependency, the South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands. It began on Friday, 2 April 1982, when Argentina invaded and occupied the Falkland Islands and, the following day, South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands in an attempt to establish the sovereignty it had claimed over them. On 5 the April, the British government dispatched a naval task force to engage the Argentine Navy and Air Force before making an amphibious assault on the islands. The conflict lasted 74 days and ended with the Argentine surrender on 14 June 1982, returning the islands to British control. In total, 649 Argentine military personnel, 255 British military personnel, and three Falkland Islanders died during the hostilities. The conflict was a major episode in the protracted confrontation over the territory's sovereignty. Argentina asserted and maintains that the islands are Argentine territory, and the Argentine government thus characterized its military action as the reclamation of its own territory. The British government regarded the action as an invasion of a territory that had been a crown colony since 1841. Falkland Islanders, who have inhabited the islands since the early 19th century, are predominantly descendants of British settlers, and strongly favor British sovereignty. Neither state officially declared war, although both governments declared the islands a war zone. Hostilities were almost exclusively limited to the territories under dispute and the area of the South Atlantic where they lie. The conflict has had a strong effect in both countries and has been the subject of various books, articles, films, and songs. Patriotic sentiment ran high in Argentina, but the outcome prompted large protests against the ruling military government, hastening its downfall. In the United Kingdom, the Conservative government, bolstered by the successful outcome, was re-elected with an increased majority the following year. The cultural and political effect of the conflict has been less in the UK than in Argentina, where it remains a common topic for discussion. Diplomatic relations between the United Kingdom and Argentina were restored in 1989 following a meeting in Madrid, at which the two governments issued a joint statement. No change in either country's position regarding the sovereignty of the Falkland Islands was made explicit. In 1994, Argentina's claim to the territories was added to its constitution. Topic. Led up to the conflict In the period leading up to the war, and, in particular, following the transfer of power between the military dictators General Jorge Rafael Videla and General Roberto Eduardo Viola late in March 1981, Argentina had been in the midst of a devastating economic stagnation and large-scale civil unrest against the military junta that had been governing the country since 1976. In December 1981 there was a further change in the Argentine military regime, bringing to office a new junta headed by General Leopoldo Galtieri acting president, Air Brigadier Basilio Lamy Dozo and Admiral Jorge Anaya. Anaya was the main architect and supporter of a military solution for the long-standing claim over the islands, calculating that the United Kingdom would never respond militarily. By opting for military action, the Galtieri government hoped to mobilize the long-standing patriotic feelings of Argentines towards the islands, and thus divert public attention from the country's chronic economic problems and the regime's ongoing human rights violations of the dirty war. Such action would also bolster its dwindling legitimacy. The newspaper La Prensa speculated in a step-by-step -step plan beginning with cutting off supplies to the islands, ending in direct actions late in 1982. If the UN talks were fruitless, the ongoing tension between the two countries over the islands increased on 19 March when a group of Argentine scrap metal merchants actually infiltrated by Argentine Marines raised the Argentine flag at South Georgia Island, an act that would later be seen as the first offensive action in the war. The Royal Navy Ice Patrol vessel HMS Endurance was dispatched from Stanley to South Georgia on 25 in response. The Argentine military junta, suspecting that the UK would reinforce its South Atlantic forces, ordered the invasion of the Falkland Islands to be brought forward to 2 April. The UK was initially taken by surprise by the Argentine attack on the South Atlantic Islands, despite repeated warnings by Royal Navy Captain Nicholas Barker and others. 
Barker believed that Defense Secretary John Knott's 1981 review in which Knott described plans to withdraw the Endurance, the UK's only naval presence in the South Atlantic had sent a signal to the Argentines that the UK was unwilling, and would soon be unable, to defend its territories and subjects in the Falklands. <laughs> Argentine invasion On 2 April 1982, Argentine forces mounted amphibious landings, known as Operation Rosario, on the Falkland Islands. The invasion was met with a nominal defense organized by the Falkland Islands Governor Sir Rex Hunt, giving command to Major Mike Norman of the Royal Marines. The events of the invasion included the landing of Lieutenant Commander Guillermo Sanchez Sabarat's Amphibious Commandos Group, the attack on Moody Brook Barracks, the engagement between the troops of Hugo Santillan and Bill Trollope at Stanley, and the final engagement and surrender at Government House. <laughs> <laughs> Initial British response Word of the invasion first reached the UK from Argentine sources. A Ministry of Defence operative in London had a short telex conversation with Governor Hunt's telex operator, who confirmed that Argentines were on the island and in control. Later that day, BBC journalist Laurie Margolis spoke with an islander at Goose Green via amateur radio, who confirmed the presence of a large Argentine fleet and that Argentine forces had taken control of the island. Operation Corporate was the codename given to the British military operations in the Falklands War. The commander of task force operations was Admiral Sir John Fieldhouse. Operations lasted from 1 April 1982 to 20 June 1982. The British undertook a series of military operations as a means of recapturing the Falklands from Argentine occupation. The British government had taken action prior to the 2 April invasion. In response to events on South Georgia, the submarines HMS Splendid and HMS Spartan were ordered to sail south on 29 March, whereas the stores ship Royal Fleet Auxiliary RFA Fort Austin was dispatched from the western Mediterranean to support HMS Endurance. Lord Carrington had wished to send a third submarine, but the decision was deferred due to concerns about the impact on operational commitments. Coincidentally, on 26 March, the submarine HMS Superb left Gibraltar and it was assumed in the press it was heading south. There has since been speculation that the effect of those reports was to panic the Argentine junta into invading the Falklands before nuclear powered submarines could be deployed. The following day, during a crisis meeting headed by the Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, the Chief of the Naval Staff, Admiral Sir Henry Leach, advised them that, Britain could and should send a task force if the islands are invaded. On 1 April, Leach sent orders to a Royal Navy force carrying out exercises in the Mediterranean to prepare to sail south. Following the invasion on 2 April, after an emergency meeting of the Cabinet, approval was given to form a task force to retake the islands. This was backed in an emergency session of the House of Commons the next day. On 6 April, the British government set up a war cabinet to provide day to day political oversight of the campaign. This was the critical instrument of crisis management for the British with its remit being to keep under review political and military developments relating to the South Atlantic, and to report as necessary to the Defence and Overseas Policy Committee. Until it was dissolved on 12 August, the War Cabinet met at least daily. Although Margaret Thatcher is described as dominating the War Cabinet, Lawrence Friedman notes in the official history of the Falklands campaign that she did not ignore opposition or fail to consult others. However, once a decision was reached she did not look back. Topic. Position of third-party countries On the evening of 3 April, the United Kingdom's United Nations Ambassador Sir Anthony Parsons put a draft resolution to the United Nations Security Council. The resolution, which condemned the hostilities and demanded the immediate Argentine withdrawal from the islands, was adopted by the Council the following day as United Nations Security Council Resolution 502, which passed with ten votes in support, one against Panama and four abstentions China, the Soviet Union, Poland and Spain. The UK received further political support from member countries of the Commonwealth of Nations and the European Economic Community. The EEC also provided economic support by imposing economic sanctions on Argentina. 
Argentina itself was politically backed by a majority of countries in Latin America, though not crucially Chile, and some members of the non-aligned movement. The New Zealand government expelled the Argentinian ambassador following the invasion. The Prime Minister, Robert Muldoon, was in London when the war broke out and in an opinion piece published in The Times he said, "...the military rulers of Argentina must not be appeased, New Zealand will back Britain all the way." Broadcasting on the BBC World Service, he told the Falkland Islanders, this is Rob Muldoon. We are thinking of you and we are giving our full and total support to the British government in its endeavours to rectify this situation and get rid of the people who have invaded your country. On 20 May 1982, he announced that New Zealand would make HMNZS Canterbury, a Leander-class frigate, available for use where the British thought fit to release a Royal Navy vessel for the Falklands. In the House of Commons afterwards, Margaret Thatcher said, the New Zealand government and people have been absolutely magnificent in their support for this country and the Falkland Islanders, for the rule of liberty and of law. The Sierra Leone government allowed task force ships to refuel at Freetown. VC-10 transport aircraft landed at Bonjul in the Gambia while flying between the UK and Ascension Island. France allowed UK aircraft and warships use of its port and airfield facilities at Dakar in Senegal. The war was an unexpected event in a world strained by the Cold War and the North-South Divide. The response of some countries was the effort to mediate the crisis and later as the war began, the support or criticism based in terms of anti-colonialism, political solidarity, historical relationships or realpolitik. The United States was concerned that a protracted conflict could draw the Soviet Union on Argentina's side, and initially tried to mediate an end to the conflict through shuttle diplomacy. However, when Argentina refused the U.S. peace overtures, U.S. Secretary of State Alexander Haig announced that the United States would prohibit arms sales to Argentina and provide material support for British operations. Both houses of the U.S. Congress passed resolutions supporting the U.S. action siding with the United Kingdom. The U.S. provided the United Kingdom with Sidewinder missiles for use by the Harrier jets. President Ronald Reagan approved the Royal Navy's request to borrow the Sea Harrier-capable amphibious assault ship USS Iwo Jima if the British lost an aircraft carrier. The United States Navy developed a plan to help the British man the ship with American military contractors, likely retired sailors with knowledge of Iwo Jima's systems. France provided dissimilar aircraft training so Harrier pilots could train against the French aircraft used by Argentina. French and British intelligence also worked to prevent Argentina from obtaining more Exocet missiles on the international market. At the same time Peru attempted to purchase 12 missiles for Argentina. In a failed secret operation, Chile gave support to the UK in the form of intelligence about the Argentine military and early warning intelligence on Argentine air movements. Throughout the war, Argentina was afraid of a Chilean military intervention in Patagonia and kept some of its best mountain regiments away from the Falklands near the Chilean border as a precaution, while France overtly backed the United Kingdom, a French technical team remained in Argentina throughout the war. French government sources have said that the French team was engaged in intelligence gathering, however, it simultaneously provided direct material support to the Argentines, identifying and fixing faults in Exocet missile launchers. According to the book Operation Israel, advisors from Israel Aerospace Industries were already in Argentina and continued their work during the conflict. The book also claims that Israel sold weapons and drop tanks in a secret operation in Peru. Peru also openly sent mirages, pilots and missiles to Argentina during the war. Peru had earlier transferred 10 Hercules transport planes to Argentina soon after the British task force had set sail in April 1982. Nick van der Bijl records that, after the Argentine defeat at Goose Green, Venezuela and Guatemala offered to send paratroopers to the Falklands. Through Libya, under Muammar Gaddafi, Argentina received 20 launchers and 60 SA 7 missiles, as well as machine guns, mortars, and mines. All in all, the load of four trips of two Boeing 707s of the AAF, refueled in Recife with the knowledge and consent of the Brazilian government. Some of these clandestine logistics operations were mounted by the Soviet Union. Topic: <inaudible> British Task Force. The British government had no contingency plan for an invasion of the islands, and the task force was rapidly put together from whatever vessels were available. 
The nuclear-powered submarine Conqueror set sail from France on 4 April, whilst the two aircraft carriers Invincible and Hermes, in the company of escort vessels, left Portsmouth only a day later. On its return to Southampton from a world cruise on 7 April, the ocean liner SS Canberra was requisitioned and set sail two days later with three commando brigade aboard. The ocean liner Queen Elizabeth II was also requisitioned and left Southampton on 12 May with 5th Infantry Brigade on board. The whole task force eventually comprised 127 ships, 43 Royal Navy vessels, 22 Royal Fleet Auxiliary ships, and 62 merchant ships. The retaking of the Falkland Islands was considered extremely difficult. The U.S. Navy considered a successful counter invasion by the British a military impossibility. Firstly, the British were significantly constrained by the disparity in deployable air cover. The British had 42 aircraft 28 Sea Harriers and 14 Harrier GR-3s available for air combat operations, against approximately 122 serviceable jet fighters, of which about 50 were used as air superiority fighters and the remainder as strike aircraft, in Argentina's air forces during the war. Crucially, the British lacked airborne early warning and control AEW aircraft. Planning also considered the Argentine surface fleet and the threat posed by Exocet equipped vessels or the two Type 209 submarines. By mid April, the Royal Air Force had set up the airbase of RAF Ascension Island, co located with Wideawake Airfield on the mid Atlantic British Overseas Territory of Ascension Island, including a sizable force of Avro Vulcan BMK 2 bombers, Hanley Page Victor KMK 2 refueling aircraft, and McDonnell Douglas Phantom FGR MK 2 fighters to protect them. Meanwhile, the main British naval task force arrived at Ascension to prepare for active service. A small force had already been sent south to recapture South Georgia. Encounters began in April. The British task force was shadowed by Boeing 707 aircraft of the Argentine Air Force during their travel to the south. Several of these flights were intercepted by Sea Harriers outside the British imposed exclusion zone. The unarmed 707s were not attacked because diplomatic moves were still in progress and the UK had not yet decided to commit itself to armed force. On the 23rd of April, a Brazilian commercial Douglas DC-10 from Varig Airlines en route to South Africa was intercepted by British Harriers who visually identified the civilian plane. Topic Recapture of South Georgia and the attack on Santa Fe The South Georgia Force, Operation Paraket, under the command of Major Guy Sheridan Erm, consisted of Marines from 42 Commando, a troop of the Special Air Service and Special Boat Service troops who were intended to land as reconnaissance forces for an invasion by the Royal Marines. All were embarked on RFA Tidespring. First to arrive was the Churchill-class submarine HMS Conqueror on 19 April, and the island was overflown by a radar mapping Handley Page Victor on 20 April. The first landings of SAS troops took place on 21 April, but—with the Southern Hemisphere autumn setting in—the weather was so bad that their landings and others made the next day were all withdrawn after two helicopters crashed in fog on Fortuna Glacier. On 23 April, a submarine alert was sounded and operations were halted, with Tidespring being withdrawn to deeper water to avoid interception. On 24 April, the British forces regrouped and headed into attack. On 25 April, after resupplying the Argentine garrison in South Georgia, the submarine era Santa Fe was spotted on the surface by a Westland Wessex has MK3 helicopter from HMS Antrim, which attacked the Argentine submarine with depth charges. HMS Plymouth launched a Westland Wasp has MK.1 helicopter, and HMS Brilliant launched a Westland Lynx has MK2. The Lynx launched a torpedo, and strafed the submarine with its pintle mounted general purpose machine gun. The Wessex also fired on Santa Fe with its GPMG. The Wasp from HMS Plymouth as well as two other Wasps launched from HMS Endurance fired as 12 ASM anti-ship missiles at the submarine, scoring hits. Santa Fe was damaged badly enough to prevent her from diving. The crew abandoned the submarine at the jetty at King Edward Point on South Georgia. With Tidespring now far out to sea, and the Argentine forces augmented by the submarine's crew, Major Sheridan decided to gather the 76 men he had and make a direct assault that day. After a short forced march by the British troops and a naval bombardment demonstration by two Royal Navy vessels Antrim and Plymouth, the Argentine forces surrendered without resistance. 
The message sent from the naval force at South Georgia to London was, "...be pleased to inform Her Majesty that the White Ensign flies alongside the Union Jack in South Georgia. God save the Queen." The Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, broke the news to the media, telling them to, "...just rejoice at that news, and congratulate our forces and the Marines." Black Buck Raids On 1 May, British operations on the Falklands opened with the Black Buck 1 attack of a series of five on the airfield at Stanley. A Vulcan bomber from Ascension flew on an 8,000 nautical mile 15,000 kilometers, 9,200 miles round trip dropping conventional bombs across the runway at Stanley and back to Ascension. The mission required repeated refueling, and required several Victor K-2 tanker aircraft operating in concert, including tanker-to-tanker -tanker refueling. The overall effect of the raids on the war is difficult to determine, and the raids consumed precious tanker resources from Ascension, but also prevented Argentina from stationing fast jets on the islands. The raids did minimal damage to the runway, and damage to radars was quickly repaired. As of 2014 the Royal Air Force website stated that all the three bombing missions had been successful, but historian Lawrence Friedman, who had access to classified documents, said in a 2005 book that the subsequent bombing missions were failures. Argentine sources said that the Vulcan raids influenced Argentina to withdraw some of its Mirage IIIs from southern Argentina to the Buenos Aires defense zone. This was later described as propaganda by Falklands veteran commander Nigel Ward. In any case, the effect of the Vulcan raids on Argentina's deployment of defensive fighters was watered down when British officials made clear that there would be no strikes on air bases in Argentina. Of the five Black Buck raids, three were against Stanley Airfield, with the other two anti radar missions using Shrike anti radiation missiles. <laughs> Escalation of the air war The Falklands had only three airfields. The longest and only paved runway was at the capital, Stanley, and even that was too short to support fast jets although an arrestor gear was fitted in April to support Skyhawks. Therefore, the Argentines were forced to launch their major strikes from the mainland, severely hampering their efforts at forward staging, combat air patrols, and close air support over the islands. The effective loiter time of incoming Argentine aircraft was low, and they were later compelled to overfly British forces in any attempt to attack the islands. The first major Argentine strike force comprised 36 aircraft A-4 Skyhawks, IAI Daggers, English Electric Canberras, and Mirage 3 Escorts, and was sent on 1 May, in the belief that the British invasion was imminent or landings had already taken place. Only a section of Grupo 6 flying IAI Dagger aircraft found ships, which were firing at Argentine defences near the islands. The Daggers managed to attack the ships and return safely. This greatly boosted morale of the Argentine pilots, who now knew they could survive an attack against modern warships, protected by radar ground clutter from the islands and by using a late pop-up profile. Meanwhile, other Argentine aircraft were intercepted by Bay Sea Harriers operating from HMS Invincible. A Dagger and a Canberra were shot down. Combat broke out between Sea Harrier FRSMK-1 fighters of No. 801 Naval Air Squadron and Mirage 3 fighters of Grupo 8. Both sides refused to fight at the other's best altitude, until two mirages finally descended to engage. One was shot down by an AIM-9L Sidewinder air-to-air -air missile AAM, while the other escaped but was damaged and without enough fuel to return to its mainland air base. The plane made for Stanley, where it fell victim to friendly fire from the Argentine defenders. As a result of this experience, Argentine Air Force staff decided to employ A 4 Skyhawks and Daggers only as strike units, the Canberras only during the night, and Mirage IIIs without air refueling capability or any capable AAM as decoys to lure away the British Sea Harriers. The decoying would be later extended with the formation of the Esquadron Phoenix, a squadron of civilian jets flying 24 hours a day simulating strike aircraft preparing to attack the fleet. On one of these flights on 7 June, an Air Force Learjet 35A was shot down, killing the squadron commander, Vice Commodore Rodolfo de la Colina, the highest-ranking Argentine officer to die in the war. Stanley was used as an Argentine strongpoint throughout the conflict. Despite the Black Buck and Harrier raids on Stanley Airfield no fast jets were stationed there for air defense and overnight shelling by detached ships, it was never out of action entirely. 
Stanley was defended by a mixture of surface-to-air missile SAM systems Franco-German Roland and British Tigercat and Swiss-built Orlikon 35mm twin anti-aircraft cannons. Lockheed Hercules transport night flights brought supplies, weapons, vehicles, and fuel, and airlifted out the wounded up until the end of the conflict. The only Argentine Hercules shot down by the British was lost on 1 June when TC-63 was intercepted by a Sea Harrier in daylight when it was searching for the British fleet northeast of the islands after the Argentine Navy retired its last SP-2H Neptune due to airframe attrition. Various options to attack the home base of the five Argentine Etendards at Rio Grande were examined and discounted Operation Mikado. Subsequently five Royal Navy submarines lined up, submerged, on the edge of Argentina's 12 nautical mile 22 kilometers, 14 miles territorial limit to provide early warning of bombing raids on the British task force. Topic. Sinking of Era General Belgrano Two British naval task forces one of surface vessels and one of submarines and the Argentine fleet were operating in the neighbourhood of the Falklands and soon came into conflict. The first naval loss was the Second World War vintage Argentine light cruiser era General Belgrano. The nuclear-powered submarine HMS Conqueror sank General Belgrano on 2 May. 323 members of General Belgrano's crew died in the incident. More than 700 men were rescued from the open ocean despite cold seas and stormy weather. The losses from General Belgrano totaled nearly half of the Argentine deaths in the Falklands conflict and the loss of the ship hardened the stance of the Argentine government. Regardless of controversies over the sinking, including disagreement about the exact nature of the maritime exclusion zone and whether General Belgrano had been returning to port at the time of the sinking, it had a crucial strategic effect, the elimination of the Argentine naval threat. After her loss, the entire Argentine fleet, with the exception of the conventional submarine era San Luis, returned to port and did not leave again during the fighting. The two escorting destroyers and the battle group centered on the aircraft carrier era 25 de Mayo both withdrew from the area, ending the direct threat to the British fleet that their pincer movement had represented. However, settling the controversy in 2003, the ship's captain Hector Bonzo confirmed that General Belgrano had actually been maneuvering, not sailing away, from the exclusion zone, and had orders to sink any British ship he could find. Further, Captain Bonzo stated that any suggestion that HMS Conqueror's actions were a betrayal was utterly wrong, rather, the submarine carried out its duties according to the accepted rules of war. In a separate incident later that night, British forces engaged an Argentine patrol gunboat, the Era Alferez Sabral, that was searching for the crew of the Argentine Air Force Canberra light bomber shot down on 1 May. Two Royal Navy Lynx helicopters fired four Sea Skua missiles at her. Badly damaged and with eight crew dead, Alferez Sabral managed to return to Puerto Deseado two days later. The Canberra crew were never found. Topic. Sinking of HMS Sheffield On 4 May, two days after the sinking of General Belgrano, the British lost the Type 42 destroyer HMS Sheffield to fire following an Exocet missile strike from the Argentine 2nd Naval Air Fighter, Attack Squadron. Sheffield had been ordered forward with two other Type 42s to provide a long-range radar and medium-high altitude missile picket far from the British carriers. She was struck amidships, with devastating effect, ultimately killing 20 crew members and severely injuring 24 others. The ship was abandoned several hours later, gutted and deformed by the fires that continued to burn for six more days. She finally sank outside the maritime exclusion zone on 10 May. The incident is described in detail by Admiral Sandy Woodward in his book 100 Days, in Chapter 1. Woodward was a former commanding officer of Sheffield. The destruction of Sheffield the first Royal Navy ship sunk in action since the Second World War had a profound impact on the British public, bringing home the fact that the Falklands Crisis, as the BBC News put it, was now an actual shooting war. The tempo of operations increased throughout the first half of May as the United Nations attempts to mediate a peace were rejected by the Argentinians. The final British negotiating position was presented to Argentina by UN Secretary General Pérez de Cuellar on 18 May 1982. In it, the British abandoned their previous red line 
That British administration of the islands should be restored on the withdrawal of Argentinian forces, as supported by United Nations Security Council Resolution 502. Instead, it proposed a UN administrator should supervise the mutual withdrawal of both Argentinian and British forces, then govern the islands in consultation with the representative institutions of the islands, including Argentines, although no Argentines lived there. Reference to self determination of the islanders was dropped, and the British proposed that future negotiations over the sovereignty of the islands should be conducted by the UN. British Special Forces operations Given the threat to the British fleet posed by the Edinburgh Exocet combination, plans were made to use C-130s to fly in some SAS troops to attack the home base of the five Edinburghs at Rio Grande, Tierra del Fuego. The operation was codenamed, Mikado. The operation was later scrapped, after acknowledging that its chances of success were limited, and replaced with a plan to use the submarine HMS Onyx to drop SAS operatives several miles offshore at night for them to make their way to the coast aboard rubber inflatables and proceed to destroy Argentina's remaining Exocet stockpile, and SAS reconnaissance team was dispatched to carry out preparations for a seaborne infiltration. A Westland Sea King helicopter carrying the assigned team took off from HMS Invincible on the night of 17 May, but bad weather forced it to land 50 miles 80 kilometers from its target and the mission was aborted. The pilot flew to Chile, landed south of Punta Arenas, and dropped off the SAS team. The helicopter's crew of three then destroyed the aircraft, surrendered to Chilean police on 25 May, and were repatriated to the UK after interrogation. The discovery of the burnt-out helicopter attracted considerable international attention. Meanwhile, the SAS team crossed the border and penetrated into Argentina, but cancelled their mission after the Argentines suspected an SAS operation and deployed some 2,000 troops to search for them. The SAS men were able to return to Chile, and took a civilian flight back to the UK. On 14 May the SAS carried out a raid on Pebble Island on the Falklands, where the Argentine Navy had taken over a grass airstrip map for FMAEA 58 Pucara light ground attack aircraft and Beechcraft T-34 Mentors, which resulted in the destruction of several aircraft. <laughs> Land battles Landing at San Carlos, Bomb Alley During the night of 21 May, the British Amphibious Task Group under the command of Commodore Michael Clapp Commodore, Amphibious Warfare, COMAW mounted Operation Sutton, the amphibious landing on beaches around San Carlos Water, on the northwestern coast of East Falkland facing onto Falkland Sound. The bay, known as Bomb Alley by British forces, was the scene of repeated air attacks by low flying Argentine jets. The 4,000 men of 3 Commando Brigade were put ashore as follows 2nd Battalion, Parachute Regiment 2 para from the Roro Ferry Norland, and 40 Commando Royal Marines from the amphibious ship HMS Fearless were landed at San Carlos, Blue Beach. 3rd Battalion, Parachute Regiment 3 para from the amphibious ship HMS Intrepid was landed at Port San Carlos, Green Beach, and 45 Commando from RFA Stromness was landed at Ajax Bay Red Beach. Notably, the waves of eight LCUs and eight LCVPs were led by Major Ewan South Taylor, who had commanded the Falklands Detachment NP-8901 from March 1978 to 1979. 42 Commando on the ocean liner SS Canberra was a tactical reserve. Units from the Royal Artillery, Royal Engineers, etc. and armoured reconnaissance vehicles were also put ashore with the landing craft, the Round Table Class LSL and Mechfloat barges. Rapier missile launchers were carried as underslung loads of Sea Kings for rapid deployment. By dawn the next day, they had established a secure beachhead from which to conduct offensive operations. From there, Brigadier Julian Thompson's plan was to capture Darwin and Goose Green before turning towards Port Stanley. Now, with the British troops on the ground, the Argentine Air Force began the night bombing campaign against them using Canberra bomber planes until the last day of the war the 14th of June. At sea, the paucity of the British ship's anti-aircraft defences was demonstrated in the sinking of HMS Ardent on 21 May, HMS Antelope on 24 May, and MV Atlantic Conveyor struck by two AM-39 Exocets on 25 May along with a vital cargo of helicopters, runway building equipment and tents. 
The loss of all but one of the Chinook helicopters being carried by the Atlantic conveyor was a severe blow from a logistical perspective. Also lost on this day was HMS Coventry, a sister to Sheffield, whilst in company with HMS Broadsword after being ordered to act as a decoy to draw away Argentine aircraft from other ships at San Carlos Bay. HMS Argonaut and HMS Brilliant were badly damaged. However, many British ships escaped being sunk because of weaknesses of the Argentine pilots' bombing tactics described below. To avoid the highest concentration of British air defences, Argentine pilots released ordnance from very low altitude, and hence their bomb fuses did not have sufficient time to arm before impact. The low release of the retarded bombs some of which the British had sold to the Argentines years earlier meant that many never exploded, as there was insufficient time in the air for them to arm themselves. A simple free-fall bomb in a low-altitude release, impacts almost directly below the aircraft, which is then within the lethal fragmentation zone of the explosion. A retarded bomb has a small parachute or air brake that opens to reduce the speed of the bomb to produce a safe horizontal separation between the bomb and the aircraft. The fuse for a retarded bomb requires that the retarder be open a minimum time to ensure safe separation. The pilots would have been aware of this but due to the high concentration required to avoid SAMs, anti-aircraft artillery, AAA, and British Sea Harriers, many failed to climb to the necessary release point. The Argentine forces solved the problem by fitting improvised retarding devices, allowing the pilots to effectively employ low-level bombing attacks on 8 June. In his autobiographical account of the Falklands War, Admiral Woodward blamed the BBC World Service for disclosing information that led the Argentines to change the retarding devices on the bombs. The World Service reported the lack of detonations after receiving a briefing on the matter from a Ministry of Defence official. He describes the BBC as being more concerned with being fearless seekers after truth than with the lives of British servicemen. Colonel H. Jones leveled similar accusations against the BBC after they disclosed the impending British attack on Goose Green by two para. Thirteen bombs hit British ships without detonating. Lord Craig, the retired marshal of the Royal Air Force, is said to have remarked, Six better fuses and we would have lost. Although Ardent and Antelope were both lost despite the failure of bombs to explode, the fuses were functioning correctly, and the bombs were simply released from too low an altitude. The Argentines lost 22 aircraft in the attacks. Topic. Battle of Goose Green From early on 27 May until 28 May, two para, approximately 500 men with naval gunfire support from HMS Aero and artillery support from 8 Commando Battery, Royal Artillery, approached and attacked Darwin and Goose Green, which was held by the Argentine 12th Infantry Regiment. After a tough struggle that lasted all night and into the next day, the British won the battle, in all, 17 British and 47 Argentine soldiers were killed. In total 961 Argentine troops including 202 Argentine Air Force personnel of the Condor airfield were taken prisoner. The BBC announced the taking of Goose Green on the BBC World Service before it had actually happened. It was during this attack that Lt. Col. H. Jones, the commanding officer of 2 Para, was killed at the head of his battalion while charging into the well-prepared Argentine positions. He was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross. With the sizable Argentine force at Goose Green out of the way, British forces were now able to break out of the San Carlos beachhead. On 27 May, men of 45 CDO and 3 Para started a loaded march across East Falkland towards the coastal settlement of Teal Inlet. Topic special Forces on Mount Kent Meanwhile, 42 Commando prepared to move by helicopter to Mount Kent. Unknown to senior British officers, the Argentine generals were determined to tie down the British troops in the Mount Kent area, and on 27 and 28 May they sent transport aircraft loaded with blowpipe surface-to-air missiles and commandos 602nd Commando Company and 601st National Gendarmerie Special Forces Squadron to Stanley. This operation was known as Operation Autoimpuesta self-determination initiative. For the next week, the SAS and the Mountain and Arctic Warfare Cadre M and AWC of 3 Commando Brigade waged intense patrol battles with patrols of the Volunteers 602nd Commando Company under Major Aldo Rico, normally second in command of the 22nd Mountain Infantry Regiment. Throughout 30 May, Royal Air Force Harriers were active over Mount Kent. 
one of them, Harrier XZ-963, flown by squadron leader Jerry Pook, in responding to a call for help from D Squadron, attacked Mount Kent's eastern lower slopes, and that led to its loss through small arms fire. Pook was subsequently awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. The Argentine Navy used their last AM-39 Exocet missile attempting to attack HMS Invincible on 30 May. There are Argentine claims that the missile struck, however, the British have denied this, some citing that HMS Avenger shot it down. When Invincible returned to the UK after the war, she showed no signs of missile damage. On 31 May, the M and AWC defeated Argentine special forces at the skirmish at Top Malo House. A 13-strong Argentine Army Commando Detachment Captain Jose Versesi's 1st Assault Section, 602nd Commando Company found itself trapped in a small shepherd's house at Top Malo. The Argentine commandos fired from windows and doorways and then took refuge in a stream bed 200 metres 700 feet from the burning house. Completely surrounded, they fought 19 M and AWC Marines under Captain Rod Boswell for 45 minutes until, with their ammunition almost exhausted, they elected to surrender. Three cadre members were badly wounded. On the Argentine side, there were two dead, including Lieutenant Ernesto Espinosa and Sergeant Mateo Sabert who were posthumously decorated for their bravery. Only five Argentines were left unscathed. As the British mopped up Top Malo House, Lieutenant Fraser Haddo's M and AWC patrol came down from Malo Hill, brandishing a large Union flag. One wounded Argentine soldier, Lieutenant Horacio Locito, commented that their escape route would have taken them through Haddo's position. 601st Commando tried to move forward to rescue 602nd Commando Company on Estancia Mountain. Spotted by 42 Commando, they were engaged with L-16 81mm mortars and forced to withdraw to Two Sisters Mountain. The leader of 602nd Commando Company on Estancia Mountain realized his position had become untenable and after conferring with fellow officers ordered a withdrawal. The Argentine operation also saw the extensive use of helicopter support to position and extract patrols. The 601st Combat Aviation Battalion also suffered casualties. At about 11 a.m. on 30 May, an Aerospatial SA-330 Puma helicopter was brought down by a shoulder-launched FIM-92 Stinger surface-to-air missile SAM fired by the SAS in the vicinity of Mount Kent. Six Argentine National Gendarmerie Special Forces were killed and eight more wounded in the crash, as Brigadier Thompson commented. It was fortunate that I had ignored the views expressed by Northwood HQ that reconnaissance of Mount Kent before insertion of 42 Commando was superfluous. Had D Squadron not been there, the Argentine Special Forces would have caught the Commando before deplaning and, in the darkness and confusion on a strange landing zone, inflicted heavy casualties on men and helicopters. <laughs> Bluff Cove and Fitzroy By 1 June, with the arrival of a further 5,000 British troops of the 5th Infantry Brigade, the new British divisional commander, Major General Jeremy Moore Erm, had sufficient force to start planning an offensive against Stanley. During this build-up, the Argentine air assaults on the British naval forces continued, killing 56. Of the dead, 32 were from the Welsh Guards on RFA Sir Galahad and RFA Sir Tristram on 8 June. According to Surgeon Commander Rick Jolly of the Falklands Field Hospital, more than 150 men suffered burns and injuries of some kind in the attack, including, famously, Simon Weston. The guards were sent to support an advance along the southern approach to Stanley. On 2 June, a small advance party of two para moved to Swan Inlet House in a number of Army Westland scout helicopters. Telephoning ahead to Fitzroy, they discovered that the area was clear of Argentines and exceeding their authority, commandeered the one remaining RAF Chinook helicopter to frantically ferry another contingent of two para ahead to Fitzroy, a settlement on Port Pleasant, and Bluff Cove, a settlement on Port Fitzroy. This uncoordinated advance caused great difficulties in planning for the commanders of the combined operation, as they now found themselves with a 30 miles (48 kilometers) string of indefensible positions on their southern flank. Support could not be sent by air as the single remaining Chinook was already heavily oversubscribed. The soldiers could march, but their equipment and heavy supplies would need to be ferried by sea. 
Plans were drawn up for half the Welsh Guards to march light on the night of 2 June, whilst the Scots Guards and the second half of the Welsh Guards were to be ferried from San Carlos Water in the landing ship Logistics LSL Sir Tristram and the landing platform dock LPD Intrepid on the night of 5 June. Intrepid was planned to stay one day and unload itself and as much of Sir Tristram as possible, leaving the next evening for the relative safety of San Carlos. Escorts would be provided for this day, after which Sir Tristram would be left to unload using a mech float a powered raft for as long as it took to finish. Political pressure from above to not risk the LPD forced Commodore Clapp to alter this plan. Two lower-value LSLs would be sent, but with no suitable beaches to land on, Intrepid's landing craft would need to accompany them to unload. A complicated operation across several nights with Intrepid and her sister ship Fearless sailing halfway to dispatch their craft was devised. The attempted overland march by half the Welsh guards failed, possibly as they refused to march light and attempted to carry their equipment. They returned to San Carlos and landed directly at Bluff Cove when Fearless dispatched her landing craft. Sir Tristram sailed on the night of 6 June and was joined by Sir Galahad at dawn on 7 June. Anchored 1,200 feet 370 meters apart in Port Pleasant, the landing ships were near Fitzroy, the designated landing point. The landing craft should have been able to unload the ships to that point relatively quickly, but confusion over the ordered disembarkation point the first half of the guards going direct to Bluff Cove resulted in the senior Welsh Guards infantry officer aboard insisting that his troops should be ferried the far longer distance directly to Port Fitzroy, Bluff Cove. The alternative was for the infantrymen to march via the recently repaired Bluff Cove Bridge destroyed by retreating Argentine combat engineers to their destination, a journey of around 7 miles 11 kilometers. On Sir Galahad's stern ramp there was an argument about what to do. The officers on board were told that they could not sail to Bluff Cove that day. They were told that they had to get their men off ship and onto the beach as soon as possible as the ships were vulnerable to enemy aircraft. It would take 20 minutes to transport the men to shore using the LCU and mech float. They would then have the choice of walking the seven miles to Bluff Cove or wait until dark to sail there. The officers on board said that they would remain on board until dark and then sail. They refused to take their men off the ship. They possibly doubted that the bridge had been repaired due to the presence on board Sir Galahad of the Royal Engineer Troop whose job it was to repair the bridge. The Welsh guards were keen to rejoin the rest of their battalion, who were potentially facing the enemy without their support. They had also not seen any enemy aircraft since landing at San Carlos and may have been overconfident in the air defences. Ewan Southby Taylor gave a direct order for the men to leave the ship and go to the beach, the order was ignored, the longer journey time of the landing craft taking the troops directly to Bluff Cove and the squabbling over how the landing was to be performed caused an enormous delay in unloading. This had disastrous consequences. Without escorts, having not yet established their air defense, and still almost fully laden, the two LSLs in Port Pleasant were sitting targets for two waves of Argentine A-4 Skyhawks. The disaster at Port Pleasant although often known as Bluff Cove would provide the world with some of the most sobering images of the war as TV news video footage showed Navy helicopters hovering in thick smoke to winch survivors from the burning landing ships. British casualties were 48 killed and 115 wounded. Three Argentine pilots were also killed. The air strike delayed the scheduled British ground attack on Stanley by two days. Argentine General Mario Menéndez, commander of Argentine forces in the Falklands, was told that 900 British soldiers had died. He expected that the losses would cause enemy morale to drop and the British assault to stall. Topic: Fall of Stanley. On the night of the 11th of June, after several days of painstaking reconnaissance and logistic build-up, British forces launched a brigade-sized night attack against the heavily defended ring of high ground surrounding Stanley. Units of three commando brigade, supported by naval gunfire from several Royal Navy ships, simultaneously attacked in the Battle of Mount Harriet, Battle of Two Sisters, and Battle of Mount Longdon. Mount Harriet was taken at a cost of two British and 18 Argentine soldiers. At Two Sisters, the British faced both enemy resistance and friendly fire, but managed to capture their objectives. The toughest battle was at Mount Longdon. British forces were bogged down by assault rifle, mortar, machine gun, artillery fire, sniper fire, and ambushes. Despite this, the British continued their advance. 
During this battle, 13 were killed when HMS Glamorgan, straying too close to shore while returning from the gun line, was struck by an improvised trailer-based Exocet MM38 launcher taken from the destroyer Era Segui by Argentine Navy technicians. On the same day, Sergeant Ian McKay of 4 Platoon, B Company, 3 Para died in a grenade attack on an Argentine bunker, which earned him a posthumous Victoria Cross. After a night of fierce fighting, all objectives were secured. Both sides suffered heavy losses. The night of 13 June saw the start of the second phase of attacks, in which the momentum of the initial assault was maintained. Two para, with light armor support from the Blues and Royals, captured Wireless Ridge, with the loss of three British and 25 Argentine lives, and the 2nd Battalion, Scots Guards captured Mount Tumbledown at the Battle of Mount Tumbledown, which cost 10 British and 30 Argentine lives. With the last natural defense line at Mount Tumbledown breached, the Argentine town defenses of Stanley began to falter. In the morning gloom, one company commander got lost and his junior officers became despondent. Private Santiago Carrizo of the 3rd Regiment described how a platoon commander ordered them to take up positions in the houses and, if a kelper resists, shoot him. But the entire company did nothing of the kind. A ceasefire was declared on the 14th of June, and the commander of the Argentine garrison in Stanley, Brigade General Mario Menendez, surrendered to Major General Jeremy Moore the same day. Topic: <laughs> Recapture of South Sandwich Islands. On 20 June, the British retook the South Sandwich Islands, which involved accepting the surrender of the Southern Thule garrison at the Corbeta Uruguay base, and declared hostilities over. Argentina had established Corbeta Uruguay in 1976, but prior to 1982 the United Kingdom had contested the existence of the Argentine base only through diplomatic channels. Casualties. <coughs> 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 In total 907 were killed during the 74 days of the conflict. Argentina 649 Ejercito Argentino Army 194 16 officers 35 non-commissioned officers NCO and 143 conscript privates. Armada de la República Argentina Navy 341 including 321 in era General Belgrano and 4 naval aviators. Amara Marines 34 Fuerza Aérea Argentina Air Force 55 including 31 pilots and 14 ground crew Gendarmeria Nacional Argentina Border Guard 7 Prefectura Naval Argentina Coast Guard 2 Civilian Sailors 16 United Kingdom a total of 255 British servicemen and 3 female Falkland Island civilians were killed during the Falklands War Royal Navy 86 plus 2 Hong Kong laundrymen see below Royal Marines 27 2 officers, 14 NCOs and 11 Marines Royal Fleet Auxiliary 4 plus 6 Hong Kong sailors Merchant Navy 6 British Army 123 7 officers, 40 NCOs and 76 privates Royal Air Force 1 1 officer Falkland Island civilians 3 women killed by friendly fire of the 86 Royal Navy personnel, 22 were lost in HMS Ardent, 19 plus 1 lost in HMS Sheffield, 19 plus 1 lost in HMS Coventry and 13 lost in HMS Glamorgan. 14 naval cooks were among the dead, the largest number from any one branch in the Royal Navy. 33 of the British Army's dead came from the Welsh Guards 32 of which died on the RFA Sir Galahad in the Bluff Cove air attacks, 21 from the 3rd Battalion, the Parachute Regiment, 18 from the 2nd Battalion, the Parachute Regiment, 19 from the Special Air Service, 3 from Royal Signals and 8 from each of the Scots Guards and Royal Engineers. The 1st Battalion, 7th Duke of Edinburgh's own Gurkha rifles lost one man. Two more British deaths may be attributed to Operation Corporate, bringing the total to 260. Captain Brian Biddick from SS Uganda underwent an emergency operation on the voyage to the Falklands. Later he was repatriated by an RAF medical flight to the hospital at Rotten where he died on 12 May. 
Paul Mills from HMS Coventry suffered from complications from a skull fracture sustained in the sinking of his ship and died on the 29th of March 1983. He is buried in his hometown of Swavesey. There were 1188 Argentine and 777 British non-fatal casualties. Further information about the field hospitals and hospital ships is at Ajax Bay and list of hospitals and hospital ships of the Royal Navy. On the Argentine side beside the military hospital at Port Stanley, the Argentine Air Force Mobile Field Hospital was deployed at Comodoro Rivadavia. <inaudible> Red Cross Box Before British offensive operations began, the British and Argentine governments agreed to establish an area on the high seas where both sides could station hospital ships without fear of attack by the other side. This area, a circle 20 nautical miles in diameter, was referred to as the Red Cross Box 48 degrees 30 s 53 degrees 45 w, about 45 miles 72 kilometers north of Falkland Sound. Ultimately, the British stationed four ships HMS Hydra, HMS Hecla and HMS Herald and the primary hospital ship SS Uganda within the box, while the Argentines stationed three Era Almirante Irizar, Bahia Paraiso and Puerto Deseado. The hospital ships were non-warships converted to serve as hospital ships. The three British naval vessels were survey vessels and Uganda was a passenger liner. Almirante Irizar was an icebreaker, Bahia Paraiso was an Antarctic supply transport and Puerto Deseado was a survey ship. The British and Argentine vessels operating within the box were in radio contact and there was some transfer of patients between the hospital ships. For example, the Uganda on four occasions transferred patients to an Argentine hospital ship. The British naval hospital ships operated as casualty ferries, carrying casualties from both sides from the Falklands to Uganda and operating a shuttle service between the Red Cross Box and Montevideo. Throughout the conflict officials of the International Committee of the Red Cross ICRC conducted inspections to verify that all concerned were abiding by the rules of the Geneva Conventions. On 12 June, some personnel were transferred from the Argentine hospital ship to the British ships by helicopter. Argentine naval officers also inspected the British casualty ferries in the estuary of the River Plate. <laughs> <laughs> British casualty evacuation Hydra worked with Hecla and Herald, to take casualties from Uganda to Montevideo, Uruguay, where a fleet of Uruguayan ambulances met them. RAF VC-10 aircraft then flew the casualties to the UK for transfer to the Princess Alexandra Hospital at RAF Rotten, near Swindon. <laughs> Aftermath This brief war brought many consequences for all the parties involved, besides the considerable casualty rate and large materiel loss, especially of shipping and aircraft, relative to the deployed military strengths of the opposing sides. In the United Kingdom, Margaret Thatcher's popularity increased. The success of the Falklands campaign was widely regarded as a factor in the turnaround in fortunes for the Conservative government, who had been trailing behind the SDP Liberal Alliance in the opinion polls for months before the conflict began, but after the success in the Falklands the Conservatives returned to the top of the opinion polls by a wide margin and went on to win the following year's general election by a landslide. Subsequently, Defence Secretary Knott's proposed cuts to the Royal Navy were abandoned. The islanders subsequently had full British citizenship restored in 1983, their lifestyle was improved by investments the UK made after the war and by the liberalisation of economic measures that had been stalled through fear of angering Argentina. In 1985, a new constitution was enacted promoting self-government, which has continued to devolve power to the islanders. In Argentina, defeat in the Falklands War meant that a possible war with Chile was avoided. Further, Argentina returned to a democratic government in the 1983 general election, the first free general election since 1973. It also had a major social impact, destroying the military's image as the moral reserve of the nation that they had maintained through most of the 20th century. Various figures have been produced for the number of veterans who have committed suicide since the war. Some studies have estimated that 264 British veterans and 350 to 500 Argentine veterans have committed suicide since 1982. 
However, a detailed study of 21,432 British veterans of the war commissioned by the UK Ministry of Defence found that only 95 had died from intentional self-harm and events of undetermined intent suicides and open verdict deaths a proportion lower than would be expected within the general population over the same period topic <inaudible> <inaudible> military analysis militarily the falklands conflict remains the largest air naval combat operation between modern forces since the end of the second world war as such, it has been the subject of intense study by military analysts and historians. The most significant lessons learned include the vulnerability of surface ships to anti ship missiles and submarines, the challenges of co ordinating logistical support for a long distance projection of power, and reconfirmation of the role of tactical air power, including the use of helicopters. In 1986, the BBC broadcast the Horizon programme, in the wake of HMS Sheffield, which discussed lessons learned from the conflict, and measures since taken to implement them, such as stealth ships and close-in weapon systems. Memorials There are several memorials on the Falkland Islands themselves, the most notable of which is the 1982 Liberation Memorial, unveiled in 1984 on the second anniversary of the end of the war. It lists the names of the 255 British military personnel who died during the war and is located in front of the Secretariat Building in Stanley, overlooking Stanley Harbour. The memorial was funded entirely by the islanders and is inscribed with the words, In memory of those who liberated us. In addition to memorials on the islands, there is a memorial in the crypt of St. Paul's Cathedral, London to the British War dead. The Falkland Islands Memorial Chapel at Pangbourne College was opened in March 2000 as a commemoration of the lives and sacrifice of all those who served and died in the South Atlantic in 1982. In Argentina, there is a memorial at Plaza San Martín in Buenos Aires, another one in Rosario, and a third one in Ushuaia. During the war, British dead were put into plastic body bags and buried in mass graves. After the war, the bodies were recovered, 14 were reburied at Blue Beach Military Cemetery and 64 were returned to the UK. Many of the Argentine dead are buried in the Argentine Military Cemetery west of the Darwin Settlement. The government of Argentina declined an offer by the UK to have the bodies repatriated to the mainland. Minefields As of 2011, there were 113 uncleared minefields on the Falkland Islands and unexploded ordnance UXOs covering an area of 13 square kilometers 5.0 square miles. Of this area, 5.5 square kilometers 2. 1 square mile on the Morrill Peninsula were classified as being suspected minefields. The area had been heavily pastured for the previous 25 years without incident. It was estimated that these minefields had 20,000 anti-personnel mines and 5,000 anti-tank mines. No human casualties from mines or UXO have been reported in the Falkland Islands since 1984, and no civilian mine casualties have ever occurred on the islands. The UK reported six military personnel were injured in 1982 and a further two injured in 1983. Most military accidents took place while clearing the minefields in the immediate aftermath of the 1982 conflict or in the process of trying to establish the extent of the minefield perimeters, particularly where no detailed records existed. On 9 May 2008, the Falkland Islands government asserted that the minefields, which represent 0.1% of the available farmland on the islands, present no long-term social or economic difficulties for the Falklands and that the impact of clearing the mines would cause more problems than containing them. However, the British government, in accordance with its commitments under the Mine Ban Treaty has a commitment to clear the mines by the end of 2019. In May 2012, it was announced that 3.7 square kilometres 1.4 square miles of Stanley Common which lies between the Stanley, Mount Pleasant Road and the shoreline was made safe and had been opened to the public, opening up a 3 kilometres 1.9 miles stretch of coastline and a further 2 kilometres of shoreline along Mullets Creek. Topic. Press and publicity Topic. Argentina 
Selected war correspondents were regularly flown to Port Stanley in military aircraft to report on the war. Back in Buenos Aires, newspapers and magazines faithfully reported on the heroic actions of the largely conscript army and its successes. Officers from the intelligence services were attached to the newspapers and leaked information confirming the official communiques from the government. The glossy magazines Gente and Siete Dias swelled to 60 pages with color photographs of British warships in flames, many of them faked, and bogus eyewitness reports of the Argentine Commando's guerrilla war on South Georgia, the 6th of May, and an already dead Pucara pilot's attack on HMS Hermes, Lieutenant Daniel Antonio Jukic had been killed at Goose Green during a British air strike on the 1st of May. Most of the faked photos actually came from the tabloid press. One of the best remembered headlines was, Estamos ganando. We're winning. From the magazine Gente, that would later use variations of it, the Argentine troops on the Falkland Islands could read Gaceta Argentina a newspaper intended to boost morale among the servicemen. Some of its untruths could easily be unveiled by the soldiers who recovered corpses. The Malvinas cause united the Argentines in a patriotic atmosphere that protected the junta from critics, and even opponents of the military government supported Galtieri. Ernesto Sabato said, Don't be mistaken, Europe, it is not a dictatorship who is fighting for the Malvinas, it is the whole nation. Opponents of the military dictatorship, like me, are fighting to extirpate the last trace of colonialism. The Madres de Plaza de Mayo were even exposed to death threats from ordinary people. HMS Invincible was repeatedly sunk in the Argentine press, and on the 30th of April 1982, the Argentine magazine Tal Qual showed Prime Minister Thatcher with an eye patch and the text "Pirate, Witch, and Assassin." Guilty. Three British reporters sent to Argentina to cover the war from the Argentine perspective were jailed until the end of the war. Topic. United Kingdom Seventeen newspaper reporters, two photographers, two radio reporters and three television reporters with five technicians sailed with the task force to the war. The Newspaper Publishers Association selected them from among 160 applicants, excluding foreign media. The hasty selection resulted in the inclusion of two journalists among the war reporters who were interested only in Queen Elizabeth II's son Prince Andrew, who was serving in the conflict. The prince flew a helicopter on multiple missions, including anti-surface warfare, exocet missile decoy and casualty evacuation. Merchant vessels had the civilian Inmarsat uplink, which enabled written telex and voice report transmissions via satellite. SS Canberra had a facsimile machine that was used to upload 202 pictures from the South Atlantic over the course of the war. The Royal Navy leased bandwidth on the U.S. Defense Satellite Communications System for worldwide communications. Television demands a thousand times the data rate of telephone, but the Ministry of Defense was unsuccessful in convincing the U.S. to allocate more bandwidth. TV producers suspected that the enquiry was half hearted, since the Vietnam War television pictures of casualties and traumatized soldiers were recognized as having negative propaganda value. However, the technology only allowed uploading a single frame per 20 minutes and only if the military satellites were allocated 100% to television transmissions. Videotapes were shipped to Ascension Island, where a broadband satellite uplink was available, resulting in TV coverage being delayed by three weeks. The press was very dependent on the Royal Navy, and was censored on site. Many reporters in the UK knew more about the war than those with the task force. The Royal Navy expected Fleet Street to conduct a Second World War style positive news campaign, but the majority of the British media, especially the BBC, reported the war in a neutral fashion. These reporters referred to the British troops, and the Argentinian troops, instead of our lads, and the Argies. The two main tabloid papers presented opposing viewpoints, the Daily Mirror was decidedly anti-war, whilst the Sun became well known for headlines such as, Stick it up your junta, which, along with the reporting in other tabloids, led to accusations of xenophobia and jingoism. The Sun was condemned for its, gotcha. Headline following the sinking of the era General Belgrano. Topic. Cultural impact There were wide-ranging influences on popular culture in both the UK and Argentina, from the immediate post-war period to the present. 
The Argentine writer Jorge Luis Borges described the war as a fight between two bald men over a comb. The words yomp and exocet entered the British vernacular as a result of the war. The Falklands War also provided material for theatre, film and TV drama and influenced the output of musicians. In Argentina, the military government banned the broadcasting of music in the English language, giving way to the rise of local rock musicians. Topic. See also Beagle Conflict, a border dispute between Chile and Argentina that involved island territory. Operation Algeciras, a failed Argentine plan to send Montaneros to sabotage British military facilities in Gibraltar Operation Soberania, plans for Argentina's invasion of Chile in 1978 and later. Reassertion of British sovereignty over the Falkland Islands 1833. Argentina United Kingdom relations Topic. Notes Topic. References Topic. Bibliography Topic. Historiography Cavides, César N. Conflict over the Falkland Islands, a never-ending story? Latin American Research Review. 29 172–87. Little, Walter. The Falklands Affair, a Review of the Literature. Political Studies, June 1984, 32 number 2 pp 296 to 310. Tulchin, Joseph S. 1987. The Malvinas War of 1982, an inevitable conflict that never should have occurred. Latin American Research Review, 22, 3, 123 to 141. Topic. External links Falkland Islands History Roll of Honor. Royal Air Force. Archived from the original on 2 April 2015. Retrieved 8 March 2015. The Falklands Roundtable, Final Edited Transcript. PDF. Miller Center of Public Affairs. The Falkland Islands Conflict 1982. Falklandswar.org.uk Schumann, Peter B. Argentinians unbewaltigte Vergangenheit. Argentina's unresolved past. Deutschlandfunk in German. The South Atlantic Metal Association 1982. Sama82.org.uk Battle Atlas of the Falklands War 1982 by land, sea and air. Naval-history.net Number 49134. The London Gazette Supplement. The 8th of October 1982. PP 12831 12861. Victoria Cross and other decorations. Number 48999. The London Gazette Supplement. The 3rd of June 1982. PP 7421 7422. Decorations specifically for the defense of South Georgia. ITB Bateria Costera Exocet and Malvinas, Entrevista con el CL, R. Ng. Julio Pérez. ITB Exocet Battery, Interview with Julio Pérez. Fuerzas Navales Magazine in Spanish, 14, 2002. Archived from the original on 2 March 2008. Ex-7th Argentine Infantry Regiment Veterans in Spanish. Coverage of the Falklands War. Radiotapes.com. Ray, Carlos Alberto, Rattenbach, Benjamin et al. in Spanish. Report Rattenbach, Report of the Commission for Analysis and Evaluation of Responsibility in the Conflict. Backquote South Atlantic. Backquote. Wikisource. Paul A. Olson, the 17th of May 2012. Operation Corporate: Operational Art and Implications for the Joint Operational Access Concept. School of Advanced Military Studies Report. DTIC. ADA 566546. Lessons of the Falklands. Department of the Navy Report. DTIC. February 1983. ADA 133333.